greet our friends everywhere with Chapter 8 of For Such a Time as This, the story of Charles Finney. This is another in the series, Stories of Great Christians, and comes to you from the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. After years of ridiculing and laughing at the weakness of Christianity as he saw it around him, Charles Finney met Jesus Christ and became the kind of Christian that made superficial believers uncomfortable. His mind was the mind of a lawyer, his profession at the time, and unless he felt that there was a strong case for a doctrine, he simply wouldn't accept it. His advisors, older ministers and well-meaning friends, all advised him to submit to the authority of tradition. But Charles Finney was committed to Jesus Christ, not a set of prescribed doctrines. As he studied and made his witness felt, many were converted. This puzzled those leaders who were sure God could not bless this young rebel. And in 1824, when he was examined for his preaching license, questions the examining board knew would raise differences between their accepted theology and Finney's developing one were avoided. So this is Mr. Finney. Yes, ma'am. We've heard about you for some time, but we never expected to see you here. Well, I, I don't know what you've heard, Mrs. Pewter, but... Oh, uh... believe me, we're very pleased that you should come to us. Our work is struggling at best, and workers are few, especially workers with the reputation of being able to actually convert people to Jesus Christ. Well, as you may or may not know, ma'am, I've just received my license to preach... I've had practically no experience in the church. And, and you think our little missionary society is the place to start? <laughs> That's right. I've spent most of my life in small backwoods towns. I think I know the kind of people who are there. And you probably know the kind of preaching they usually get. I used to laugh at the visiting ministers along with everyone else. And uh, you're not afraid of being laughed at yourself? No, ma'am. We laughed because those who came to preach didn't really have anything to say. Some couldn't even read the Bibles they held in their hands. They made such big mistakes that everyone knew it. You couldn't take them seriously. But I'm not going out that way. I know the Scriptures, and I know Jesus Christ. And if I've had any success talking with people, it's because Jesus Christ is with me. No, the only laughter I expect to hear is shouts of joy from those who give themselves to Jesus. Mr. Finney... You remind me of why I ever started this work. Thank you. The Lord bless you and welcome. And so it was that Charles Finney, at the age of 32, took his first preaching assignment, or perhaps we should say assignments. There were two churches, one in Evans Mills and another about 18 miles away in Antwerp, New York. In the case of Evans Mills, the available building, a school could only be used on alternate Sundays. In Antwerp, there was no religious activity at all. Charles rode from Evans Mills to Antwerp every week, and his ministry began to yield surprising results. Now, I've been preaching here at Evans Mills on three different Lord's Days, and I've heard that you've highly complimented my preaching. Well, I'm glad to see the size of this congregation grow, but, but I'm not pleased at the state of things here at all. I didn't come here to please you. I came, I came to secure the salvation of your souls. I don't care how much you like my preaching if you reject my master. And so, so I'm going to put it to you straight. I'm wasting my time with you if, if you're liking my preaching does you no real good. And I won't waste my time that way. In the words of Abraham's servant, now will you deal kindly and truly with my master? If you will, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may return to the right hand or to the left. Now this... This is what I have to know tonight. You admit that what I preach is the gospel. You even profess to believe it. 
Now will you receive it? I, I must know your minds tonight. Do you intend to receive the gospel to become Christians or reject it? I will not labor in vain with you. Now I want you who have made up your minds to become Christians and who are resolved to make your peace with God immediately to show your intentions by standing. But on the other hand, those of you who are resolved not to become Christians and wish me to so understand and wish Christ to so understand, sit still. I await your action. All right, you're committed. You have made your decision clear. You have rejected Christ and his gospel. And you are witnesses one against the other, and God is witnessed against you all. This is explicit, and you may remember as long as you live that you have thus publicly committed yourselves against the Savior. You have said, we will not have this man, Jesus Christ, to reign over us. Why do you stop? You were leaving, weren't you? Oh, oh, you poor dear people. I am so sorry for you. And, and the Lord willing, I'll preach to you again tomorrow night. Brother Finney, you've got to. Oh, hello, Deacon McGrady. I didn't expect to see any deacons from the Baptist church here tonight. Every Christian is warmed by the truth, Brother Finney. Tonight was one of the most thrilling experiences I've had. You've got to. They can't rest under this. Uh, I don't know. Oh, take heart, man. I intended to put them into a position that when they thought about it, they'd tremble at what they'd done. So you have, so you have. The very thing that should have been done long ago. Ah, oh, Brother Finney, we shall see the results of this. Mark me. He put us under an oath to reject God. He made us publicly pledge not to serve God. We wouldn't have rejected God if he hadn't made us do it. Let's give him his walking papers. Tar and feathers and run him out of town on a rail. I believe the whole town is turned out tonight, Brother Finney. Yeah, there's no room left. Now, Spirit of God, reach out and capture these souls for your own. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. Where's Finney? It's important. You're only the 20th person today who's come banging at this door. Well, where is he? Heaven only knows. This morning with some man who said his wife was unable to speak since last night's meeting. Then some other man come and said his brother's paralyzed somehow and keeps calling out to God. All kinds of strange things happened last night. Conviction. Huh? The conviction of God. Last night... Finney stood up, and for almost two hours, the words of God poured from his mouth. The schoolhouse was suffocatingly full. Most there was there to see Finney lynched. Oh, my. But it was a glorious sight. Hmm. Man and woman wept and groaned. Some fell in sobbing fits. Others collapsed. Now this town is suffering under the conviction of God. Finney and I spent all yesterday afternoon praying for this. And it's happened. All these strange sicknesses are, are from God? No, no, not from God. These people have been faced with their separation from God. The 
God they've ignored all their lives. And Finney has made that separation clear. The fact of their separation is too much for them. Just breaking them in pieces. Well, what's it all leading to? Deacon McGrady. Oh, there he is. Deacon McGrady. Everywhere, everywhere they're turning. Everywhere men and women are breaking down before God and crying for his mercy. It's happening, McGrady. This whole town is turning to God. Gentlemen, let's proceed to the business before us. That is the ordination of Mr. Charles Finney. Uh, As you know now, Mr. Finney cannot be with us because of an extremely active work he has underway in Evans Mills. However, I don't believe we actually need him here to arrive at a decision. Now, there's no doubt as to the man's success in the bringing of the gospel to those among whom he preaches. Yes, but have you heard him preach? I haven't, but... I believe some of you have. Disgraceful. Lowers the dignity of the pulpit to a common bleeding parlor. Why, I saw him preach at one time when he felt the pulpit was too far from the congregation. So he walked up and down the aisles delivering his message. And the man rarely prepares a sermon, never reads one. But he is successful. Never uses a classic illustration. Always gives examples from the lives of those he's among. No finesse. No no dignity. And he refers to sinners as you. Actually makes one quite nervous. Well, I hadn't expected to find quite so much opposition to his ordination. I said to him once that I was more inclined to weep over sinners than to blame them as he does. Yeah, well, yeah. It seems like that's the way it And he be. said... He said he'd be more inclined that way, too, if he believed them to be helpless sinners with no way out. <laughs> you see, his theological views haven't changed. Well, indeed, they haven't. Well, then, am I to take this presbytery's comments to me in that we will not ordain Mr. Finney? No, I don't think that's what we mean. Uh, let's say, rather, that uh, we rather like the reputation he's brought to the presbytery... And he should certainly be made one of us, but that uh, we should not encourage him to preach in any of our actual churches. Yes, he he seems to do very well in the fields and the barns and the schoolhouses. (laughs) Perhaps that is where he should be allowed to work. (laughs) I suppose there's room for all kinds of ministries, although with Mr. Finney, I have my doubts. All right, then it is settled. Although we are not in complete agreement as to Mr. Finney's theology or his methods, we see certain value in his work, and we will ordain him as a minister of the gospel. And so we conclude Chapter 8 of For Such a Time as This, the story of Charles Finney. This is another in the series, Stories of Great Christians, and comes to you from the radio studios of the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago.